Hi, my name is Jeff Dubbins and I'm the president of PRP Wine International. I want to welcome you to our inaugural virtual showcase wine tastings. Uh, first and foremost, I hope everyone out there is healthy and safe. As part of our PRP family, your health and safety is one of our top priorities. During this very unique and unusual time, we're trying new and different ways to reach out to our clients and be able to provide the in-person wine service that we always have. With this, we're trying a virtual wine tasting. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, and it, we are learning as we go along. I want to thank our winemakers who not only provided us these wonderful wines, but took some time to do a nice little video presentation to introduce them to you. Uh, I hope you have fun. I'd like to hope you will learn a little something from this as well. If you have feedback or information, please send it to me at the email below. I'd love to hear from you. This is a work in progress and we always want to improve. So thank you, and now for the fun part. All right, folks, so uh, welcome. I'd like to first start by thanking each and every one of you for attending today's event. This is our third and final virtual wine showcase here across the United States. We had great success and feedback from the clients like yourselves that attended on Wednesday evening, also last evening. Uh, just to give you a quick heads up, this should last a little over an hour. We do have a little bit more time here on Saturday with it being a midday tasting as opposed to an evening tasting. We didn't want to make it, uh, we didn't want to make it too late running uh, for our East Coast clients uh, on last evening and on Wednesday. I'd also like to introduce myself. I'm Jason Lima. I'm one of the district managers here in the United States. I actually reside in Florida. I'm live to you currently from uh, the Tampa office and on the Gulf Coast of Florida. About 100 degrees out today, so certainly a day where some nice uh, fruity or dry white wines would certainly cleanse the palate. Uh, before we get started, I'd like just to take a moment. Obviously, we're going into Memorial Day weekend here. Uh, with Memorial Day Monday, I'd like to quick, take a quick moment of silence in recognition of all of those fallen, fallen soldiers over past wars and those yet to have happened and say thank you for their service, but they also provided the greatest sacrifice, which was their life. So I'm going to bow my head for a moment and would love for everybody to join in doing so to say thank you to those that gave the greatest sacrifice for this country. Fantastic. A toast to them will be coming shortly. With that being said, you know, who do we need to think most importantly? That would be you, our attendees, or our clients. You know, it's been a really precarious situation that we've gone through over these last eight weeks, both as individuals, families, and the working world with our kids at school. I can certainly tell you from my experience, having a 14 year old and 11 year old boys schooling from home, uh, I've taken some uh, algebra classes for the first time in the last uh, 30 years, so I had to bone up on the Pythagorean theorem a few times myself here alongside my children. I'm sure many of you have consumed much greater quantities of wine uh, and have a much greater respect for the teaching industry uh, now that we've become surrogate teachers alongside of those virtually helping our students and, and children along the way. Also, I would like to say, you know what, during this time, we haven't been able to reach out in our normal ways to potential clients and to you as our existing clients other than on the phone. This is why we went along with creating both our virtual vintages for private tastings alongside of your wine consultant in a virtual setting like this. We've also created this event as a way to allow you to learn a little bit about some wine today. Um, also to meet some of our winemakers, the people that are the magic behind the scenes, so to speak, for the wines that you've enjoyed for maybe months, years, or decades as a client. Also a great thank you goes out to the corporate staff, um, our ownership and allowing and helping us to put this together. 
you know, the winemakers themselves did a great job with the videos that you'll be seeing in the coming, uh, you know, moments. Also, last but not least, you know, there's a gentleman that I'd like to uh, recognize. His name is Dan Bainbridge. He's one of our behind the scenes people. He's our graphics and IT artist up at our corporate office. Honestly, without his help, this would look completely different in terms of the quality of production on the video side. So thank you, Dan Bainbridge. A couple uh, side things that I'd like to go through, some housekeeping items, so to speak, that I'd like, I'd like to take you through um, are, are the wines that you received. You should have received six wines in your wine sample kit. The first being our Gold Flake um, Sparkling, which we'll start off with shortly. Second is our Blue Bottle Bordeaux, which is a white Sauvignon Blanc from France. Thirdly, our last white in the program today is our Mosul Green Bottle Cabinet Riesling. Uh, after that, we'll move into three red wines, first being a dry Malbec from Argentina, followed by a brand new wine to the program that we've never carried called the Roger 1930 Limited Lot from Chile. And we'll finish off with a great sweeter style wine from the southern part of Spain in Jumilla. And this is a great lineup of wines and I hope you agree as you go through the tasting. Also, you should have received along with your six wines, a little thank you from us as a gift, as a client. These are four slate coasters embossed with our PRP logo. Certainly a great reminder every time you set a glass of wine down on there uh, where, you're, where those wines have come from, which are your fantastic wine consultants. Once again, without our wine consultants and you, our clients, we certainly wouldn't be in the position we're in currently, which is happily moving forward after these long eight weeks of stay at home orders around the United States. Last but not least, I'd like to show and uh, make sure you have out your wine menu. This is a two-sided menu. I'll come back to the back side of this menu and explain a little bit more about that later in the tasting. But most importantly is the front side. So the front side at the top should say virtual wine showcase wine list. These are the actual six wines in the order that we will go through them as we see the winemakers videos. And I give a little bit of additional information to support the information they're providing. You'll also see on the other side of the menu, the price per bottle. So those are the pricing on the wines that are being uh, premiered here today. And then lastly, on the front side, you'll see down the middle section an area where you can make some ratings. When you're tasting wines, whether it be at tasting rooms in California for our East or West Coast clients, or whether it's in-home tastings or events you've attended with us, I always recommend to our clients to certainly make some notes or ratings on the wines you're tasting. It makes it really important after sampling a number of wines through the next hour or so to decide which wines you like best. At the conclusion of the tasting, your wine consultants will be reaching out to you personally in order to give you an opportunity to place an order on any of the wines you're tasting today or any of the wines beyond those in our program which amounts to another 50 or 60 choices on the back side of the menu. So last but not least, before I propose a toast and we move on to our first winemaker's presentation, I would like to let you know the link of this, this video is being recorded um, for quality purposes, as they say over many uh, call services or call centers when they call you. I will be sending a link out both to you as a client to be able to review in the coming days and weeks ahead, as well as to your wine consultant. So if there's any technical issues you might experience uh, through the course of this tasting, you'll have a link to be able to go back to and reference back to in the coming week ahead. So with that, I would like to propose a toast. If everybody has a little bit of champagne, I'll give you a moment or sparkling wine, excuse me, in your glass. I'd like to propose a toast to everybody. Um, but beyond the toast to our fallen veterans um, from previous wars, I would also like to praise a toast to you. And uh, my toast to you is simply this. As you go down the banister of life, may the, or as you slide down the banister of life, may the splinters never face the wrong direction. So cheers to each and every one of you for attending and thank you kindly. Hmm, not sure what you guys think about that, but a fantastic celebratory wine or a brunch wine there. Also, one other point is a 
lot of times, many of you may pour heavier glasses of wine through the course of a tasting when you're just with friends. My suggestion, just to make sure you don't feel rushed as we go through these six wines, is to pour about two to three ounces of wine into your glass as opposed to a full glass. Most certainly, you're welcome to continue consuming these wines post-tasting, but if you were to pour a full glass of wine, one, you might feel a little rushed going through that wine um, as we move from wine to wine across the six uh, wines today, but also uh, you might catch a little bit of a uh, more highly intense buzz at the end of the tasting as well. So um, about two to three ounces is perfect to, to pour as we go through. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our first winemaker video. This comes to us from Amy and Lars. Um, they are gonna tell you a little bit about our Gold Flakes Zeck sparkling wine from Germany. So please enjoy and let me bring up the video. about German sparkling wine, we are going to talk about sect. And when we talk about sect, Amy, we talk about <laughs> um, what are we talking about? Can you give us an overview of what this is? And uh, um, that's the question. Sure, sect is to Germany what um, Champagne is to France, what Cava is to Spain, what Prosecco is to Italy. It is Germany's uh, traditional sparkling and it comes in a variety of styles and a variety of production uh, methods, but they are delicious and should drink a lot more of them. Hello, today I would like to present you the Pierrot Gold Sparkling. It's a special, unique product from uh, Germany. We have included some gold flakes in the bottle and if you shake it, you can see the, the glittering in the bottle. In the nose, it's got some flavors of apricot and peach. And um, the Mousseau, the, the sparkling of, of this product, is very smooth and broad and gives you a fresh, refreshing impression of a fantastic German sparkling wine. Cheers. Well, thank you very much, Lars and Amy. I'm gonna go ahead and share a little bit of a different screen with you guys. This is gonna give you a little bit more information regarding this particular wine and also with an explanation from myself verbally. So on your screen, you should certainly see the Piroth Gold with a little bit more information. So Lars had mentioned uh, the term cuvee. I'd like to explain that a little bit more. In wine terms, a cuvee is typically what's known as a blend, another word for a blend, meaning the winemaker has chosen to use more than one varietal in producing this wine, in this case, the sparkling. Uh, the blend in this is a non-vintage wine um, because they are using grapes from different years or growing seasons. So if you look at your wine menu under the code for this, you'll see PLP XXD. The XX is an indication to us that it's not a single vintage wine, but a wine using grape varietals from different growing seasons. On top of that, the two grape varietals that comprise this wine are the Riesling, of course, being the most prevalent and most important grape varietal in Germany, and then the Trebbiano. The Trebbiano is an Italian grape varietal. Some of you may or may not have experienced this in your glass previously as a wine consumer and lover, but also know that this grape is known in the cognac region as the Uni Blanc. And so this is the grape varietal that makes the fantastic cognacs that some of you may have experienced at various times in your life. On top of that, stylistically, 
sparkling wines or champagnes or cavas or zex can all be from very sweet to very dry. This one really falls more towards the middle of that in terms of sweetness or dryness. It's what's known stylistically as a demi-sec. This is a style to me that is perfect for large gatherings. So as the celebratory times come back into play, whether it be personal celebrations related to work, births of children, anniversaries, special occasions, heck, even just wanting to have a nice sparkling wine with Sunday brunch, to me, this is a perfect sparkling wine to open for a group of people because you're not gonna alienate the palate of a sweet drinker and you're not gonna alienate the palate of a super dry wine drinker. This falls perfectly in the middle for all types of wine drinkers. Just to add a little bit more to the gold flakes as Lars showed the, showed the bottle or displayed the bottle, I certainly wouldn't suggest necessarily shaking it or you may end up with a little bit of uh, fizzy sparkling wine uh, on your carpet or in your face when you open it. But as he did tilt that bottle, you do see the gold flakes falling through the wine. It's a great little marketing piece because it adds that little extra specialness to this wine when they decided to add these gold flakes some years back. A little background on that is that gold flakes had been utilized in Germany when making pastries and cakes and such for very special occasions. So hence, they took that from the baking industry, incorporated it, in, it incorporated that into the sparkling wine you're tasting currently, and thereby providing a little bit of an extra celebratory uh, you know, opportunity with that. With that being said, the last point on sparkling wines in general, and particularly with this, I myself, as, as a wine drinker, is primarily a dry red drinker, or in cases like today in Florida where it's nearly 100 degrees, might pull out a nice uh, semi-dry to dry white that's a little bit, uh, you know, nice on the palate, thirst quenching. But with sparkling wines, since they're gonna be situations for celebrations as an individual or a family in the coming weeks, months, and years ahead, I've always recommended to my clients to keep at least six to 12 bottles of sparkling wine on hand for those types of occasions. And I think this one really foots the bill, so to speak, as a great wine to have in your wine collection or selection for those special occasions. With that being said, we're gonna be moving on to our first white wine. Uh, before I do that and introduce you to Mr. Laurent, who is the owner of the vineyard for the white Bordeaux wine. Um, can I get a show of hands of those of you that really enjoyed this sparkling wine at the bottom of your device? You should be able to raise your hand. And uh, wonderful, wonderful. It seems as though we have a good number of people enjoying it. We, we have, like I said, a little over 250 people attending currently. Uh, we have nearly 100 of you really enjoying this wine or sparkling wine. So we greatly appreciate that and hope you found maybe a new favorite to add to your wine selection at home. So with that being said, let me go ahead and pull up uh, the video from Mr. Laurent. He's gonna tell you about our Blue Bottle White Bordeaux wine from France. Hi. Hi, wine lovers in the uh, US. This is Laurent speaking from uh, Bordeaux. I hope that you guys are all doing well and that you manage to stay safe during this tragic pandemic that hits all of us all around the world. Today I talk to you from my confinement place. I'm confined at our house by the beach, uh, one hour drive from uh, Bordeaux. And uh, so I'm here confined with my family, with my doggy that is just below the table with me. And uh, yeah, having to drive every day back and forth to the wineries in, the, in Bordeaux. It's a one hour drive, so nothing to complain complicated but uh, that's uh, how we cope with this uh, pandemia here in uh, here in, in France I also hope that you guys despite this difficult period of time managed to enjoy some uh, wine and uh, talking about wine today I will be tasting for you this white dry Sauvignon Blanc from Bordeaux that we bottled for you earlier this year 
So we made we made this one with grapes of Sauvignon Blanc that we produced in one of our wineries in, nor in the northern part of the region of Bordeaux, where the terroir offers the best grapes of Sauvignon Blanc for this type of fresh and uh, not wooded uh, wine. First little comment, but um, maybe you are totally familiar with that. We have a white dry that did not age in oak barrels. So we want this wine to be very refreshing. We want it to be thin. We want it to be straight. So we should lower the temperature to approximately 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's have a look at the robe. So it is very light, actually. Uh, and it shows a pale lemon yellow. We have a few tears and they go down quite fast, so not so much alcohol in this in this wine. I can see on the label that it's a 12.5 degrees, so it's yeah, it's let's say medium alcohol. The nose, mm. Mm, very nice. The wine is very aromatic. I have notes of uh, white flowers notes of passion fruit and uh, the aromas are actually quite intense what about the mouth now well it's well balanced well balanced sorry and uh, very easy to drink the mouth is very much in line with the nose. Nice aromas of white flower. I have white peach here. A little bit of honey too. And in the aftermath, I have hints of uh, citrus and passion fruits. And it lasts. Mm. Yes, it's long in mouth. Pretty good. And um, yes, and I hope also that you will uh, notice this little acidity that we have. We feel it, not too strong, but we have it. And uh, definitely it helps structures the wine. It keeps it uh, straight, very refreshing. It gives a little note of minerality. It's very nice. Uh, maybe last comment on, on, on food pairing. Um, first, my first tip would be, there's not so much alcohol, so definitely you can drink it alone as an aperitif. It works very well. Uh, for those who have access to fresh oysters, definitely that would be a must, but maybe it's not the case for, for all of you guys. So white fish cooked in oven, definitely that would be nice, but not barbecued. The, the, the wine wouldn't be powerful enough to cope with the uh, the barbecue notes and the um, on the fish white fish for sushi lovers it's it's a no-brainer go for this wine it will be perfect with uh, with any type of sushi um, last maybe if you want to try something a bit more funky um, right now in the region of Bordeaux it's the peak season for asparagus yeah. so I can only recommend you to go and try this one with uh, green asparagus with the smoked salmon so yep these asparagus with smoked salmon and the bottle of this um, Sauvignon Blanc for Bordeaux they, it would be uh, this should make you happy for the rest of the day Guys, thank you for listening to me. Stay safe and uh, have a great tasting of uh, this wine. Ciao. Well, I would like to say thank you to Mr. Laurent. Um, I find it quite funny, as I'm sure many of you that have been working virtually from home, that we got to meet, we had a chance to meet his daughters via Zoom bomb. So I've heard some very interesting stories in the news. <laughs> along with some interesting stories from colleagues that I know and peers and friends that uh, have been quite different than even just seeing a, a child in the background. So um, one, I wanted to tell you, he did say the serving temperature. So just to make sure that you're aware that the optimum serving temperature of this wine is 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it could have been a little hard with his accent to, to make that out, so I do want to make sure you guys are aware of that. I'm going to go ahead and pull up a little bit more of the information slide on this wine and tell you guys a little bit more as well. 
And here she is. So with that, you guys have a little more information regarding this wine that I'd like to add to as well. So one of the fun things about uh, this wine to me, as we move into the you know warmer season and pretty much all of the country, particularly in parts of Arizona, Florida, um, but also in the Midwest and whatnot, this to me is a fantastic wine to have on hand for those days where you're just not in, you know, you're just not in the mood for a glass of water, you know, after doing some yard work possibly. But if you are looking for a great thirst quenching white that's dry and unoaked, I think this is a perfect, perfect wine to accompany that occasion. With that being said as well, just a little bit of a background regarding uh, his vineyard. So he took over the vineyards that have been around much longer since he took over and purchased those vineyards in Bordeaux. But he did take them over ownership wise in 2012. Uh, he does actually own 200 hectares of vineyards or vines, um, which is an equivalent of nearly 500 acres of vineyards. A hectare is defined as 2.47 acres. So once again, though he produces this Savion Blanc from us, he also does produce red Bordeaux as well. Also, a little bit of an interesting note regarding the Savion Blanc grape itself. Back in the early 18th century in France, it was crossed with the Cabernet Franc to produce what is known as probably the greatest red grape varietal known to man currently around the world, certainly in production, oftentimes in quality, um, and that is the Cabernet Sauvignon, or Cabernet, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. The Cabernet coming from the Cabernet Franc grape, when it was crossed with the Cabernet Sauvignon, hence Cabernet Sauvignon from the Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this wine. Can I get a show of hands of those of you that have enjoyed? I know some people really enjoy those nice dry whites as we move into the summer months particularly. Great, it looks like we've got about 70 participants that have enjoyed that wine. Um, in this particular uh, hand raising uh, button, I did uh, embed a five case minimum delivery for next Tuesday to your home on this wine. So thank you very much as a, uh, you know, your wine consultants are be, gonna be greatly appreciative of your order of this wine. Um, but uh, look forward to five cases showing up uh, next week. Uh, I, I just joking obviously there, but certainly a great wine that you can uh, take a conversation with post tasting here and uh, have in your wine rack in the days and weeks ahead. So before we move on to our third wine and giving you a chance to finish up this wonderful white Bordeaux, I do want to make a note that Torsten will be telling you a little bit about the Mosul Green Bottle Cabinet from Germany. Also, there's a video in there about the Mosul region itself. Some of it is done in English, spoken in English. Some of that video also has Killian, um, and he does speak in German with English subtitles, so do be aware that there will be English subtitles beneath uh, that particular video. Lastly, for our California clients out there on the West Coast, they're still working with the uh, last vintage of this wine. So some of you have the 2019 vintage, which has the twist off cap to it. Some of you do not and have the 2018 vintage that you're sampling that does not have a twist off, but a natural cork. Also once, but la or lastly, Torsten is displaying a bottle that was produced and labeled of the same wine for one of our sister companies in England. So do know he's speaking about the same wine you're sampling, but it does show a slightly different label for our counterparts over in England. So with that, let me introduce you to Torsten and Killian. When I 
arbeitet eigentlich mit einer super Aussicht. Man steht in den Weinbergen und guckt auf die Mose, guckt auf das Tal, guckt auf die Dörfer. Außerdem sind hier unsere Reben und das, was uns auch hier hält und was uns Spaß macht. Und deswegen bin ich eigentlich auch froh, in der Mose zu leben. Between the hills of the Hunsrück and Eifel, amidst the Rhenish Slate Mountains, the wine-growing region alongside the rivers Mosel, Saar and Ruhr is believed to be the oldest in Germany. 2,000 years of high culture, Celts, Romans, clergy, nobility, they all left their marks. Breathtaking discoveries, the world's highest density of ancient Roman remains. A melting pot brimming with cultural history, the forces of nature and wine growing tradition. Was wir an der Mose ganz gut können, ist Rieslinge zu produzieren aus sehr reifen Trauben. Ob trocken oder restsüß, einfach nicht so viel Alkohol haben und trotzdem viel Kraft, viel Körper. Man hat dann immer noch ein bisschen Säure, also ein schönes Süße- und Säurespiel. Und das zeichnet die Mose Rieslinge dann insbesondere aus. Truly backbreaking work. 2000 years ago, Roman settlers already planted vines on the steep slopes alongside the riverbanks. It's the world's largest wine growing region consisting entirely of steep slopes. Durch die Handlese haben wir die Möglichkeit durch jede Parzelle zwei oder dreimal zu gehen, immer das reifste Lese gut rauszulesen und da auch etwas bessere Qualität zu ernten. Umso später die Ernte ist, umso besser eigentlich auch die Qualität. There's an incredible variety of culinary traditions. You can have a solid cut of meat as well as a fried eel from the Mosel, with the ambiances ranging from the height of sophistication to downright rustic. With a glass of wine, of course. Man hat das ganze Jahr gearbeitet nur dafür, dass, dass man nachher diesen Wein in der Flasche hat. Wenn das dann noch gut ist, das ist natürlich dreimal schön und das freut einen umso mehr. Hello everybody. Today I would like to present you the Kronenberger Kurfürstle Riesling Cabinet. It's a wine from the Mosel. Um, the local community is called Kronenberger. It is nearby um, the town Bernkastle Kuss. So um, the single vineyard Kurfürstle is a very uh, famous uh, vineyard with uh, really steep slopes so that uh, you have a very nice sun exposure and the um, grapes can ripen very well. So um, you can see on the front label a little coin. It is uh, from Augustus. It is the son of um, the Roman Caesar. And um, in this wine, we will have a look at the nose. Very nice um, aromas of apple and peach. On the palate, we have um, also like a watermelon, a little bit of honey melon, and again apple and peaches. Also a nice acidity from the Riesling. It's really typical for Riesling, the acidity. But it's uh, really well balanced with a nice sugar level. Um, this wine is um, kind of sweet, but not too sweet because of the acidity of the Riesling. So um, a really good one, which can also age for um, some years, um, but you can uh, also drink it now as a young wine. And um, the alcohol level is uh, really quite low, with uh, just 9% of alcohol. Okay, enjoy this amazing and great wine. See you, goodbye. Well, thank you very much uh, from Torsten and Killian there in Germany. I hope you guys saw some of those beautiful vineyard sites along the Mosul River. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the information slide on this and tell you a little bit more about this fantastic wine as well as it may remain in your glass or you may even be on your uh, second sample of this wine. The German Cabinet is a wine in germ in wine terms that means the grapes are picked fully ripened from the main harvest what that really tells us is that when the harvest starts occurring in mid to late september in the northern hemisphere these are the grape clusters that are taken off to produce this wine as torsten had mentioned 
not a sweet wine, not a dry wine, but certainly has a little bit of residual sugar along with some great fruit tones, both on the nose as well as on the palate. This to me is a very interesting wine, as you saw on the pictures of, uh, you know, during the video of the steepness of those vineyards along the Mosul River. That's completely an impossibility for any sort of machinery to, tra you know, to traverse in picking the clusters of grapes. So what you saw there were folks up in there taking their shears with baskets and and taking off the clusters of grapes, looking for the best clusters of grapes in order to produce the best cabinet, which is once again, a term that means the best grapes from the beginning or the main harvest. This is a wine that to me is not only perfect because of it's just not dry, not sweet nature, but also a great wine to sample with chicken, also any other sort of fowl like say turkey, um, during the holiday season, but a great, great, great German expression of a pure Roth wine that dates back to our foundings here in the U.S. in the early 70s. One other no note that I would like to go ahead and, and, and speak about, for those of you that have um, one of the 2019 vintages, um, you do see a twist off um, on, the, on the bottle. So when you do, you know, get rid of the cork, so to speak, and replace it with either a composite or a plastic cork, or in this case, a twist off. Oftentimes you do lose a little bit of the romance that comes along with the pop, so to speak, as you uncork a bottle of wine. But there are a lot of studies that have been shown that the twist offs are certainly a great form of sealing the wine for preservation, whether it be for weeks, months, years, or even decades. There's certainly a debate between various winemakers and regions around the world to which they prefer natural cork or twist offs. But the one thing I can tell you as a consumer, this isn't 15 or 20 years ago where you would walk into the gas station, grab a bottle of Sutter, Sutter Home. It was a twist off, it was $2 a bottle and certainly was a mass produced wine at an inexpensive price you'll find wines of varying price from all over the world with great quality that are both sealed with twist offs as in this case or natural corks. So please do not disregard that in your winemaking choices in the current environment in the wine industry today. So with that, please take a moment and cleanse your palate with some food or snacks that you might've prepared. Uh, we do want to cleanse that palate as we're going to be moving on to our three red wines here shortly. I'd like to pull up a little bit of a slide about our gift service um, to tell you a little bit more about that in case you've never been introduced to that previously. And in doing so, this will give you a little bit of time to either rinse your glass, finish sipping the white wine, and pour your first red. So let me go ahead and pull that slide up. So as you can see here on our video, it's our wine gift service. So this is really a much more in-depth conversation you should certainly have either post-tasting or in the weeks and months ahead with your wine consultant, but we do want to make sure you're aware of this. Our gift service really is comprised of two different you know, options, so to speak. One is for special occasions, both personally and business-wise, such as weddings or anniversaries and the personal side of the house, maybe in businesses for sales uh, contests within your organization, for thank you gifts for a great quarter or a great year for your employees, but also most commonly we see our clients utilizing gift service and customized labels for holiday gifts for their employees and or their clients. I mean, let's face it, whether the year ends up being spectacular for you or a little bit softer for you because of the economic environment, certainly thanking those that did allow you to stay where you're at now and being able to make an income and be successful this year, this may be a great option to discuss with your wine consultant. 
So about six or seven of our most popular wines in our everyday program are available for customized label production using pictures, logos, and text. Also, you'll see on a picture the secondary part of our program and gift service, which is laser inscription. You see a wine glass there inscribed with our uh, PRP logo. We have many other options available that are wine related gifts that are not essentially just a bottle of wine to give that can be customized and laser inscribed with your logo or script for gift giving purposes. So with that being said, I hope you guys are ready to move on to our first red wine. This is a fantastic and spectacular wine from Argentina, a Malbec. So I'm going to introduce you to Miss Vicky. She's the head winemaker of uh, our, our counterparts there in Argentina at the winery that's in the foothills of the Mendoza region and the foothills of the Andes Mountains. So I hope you enjoy this fantastic wine and the introduction of Miss Vicky. Cheers. Mendoza is a very special place for quality grapes growing. We are located near from the Andes range. These mountains are really high, so we always have ice and snow precipitation there. That in summertime, it melted and the water comes through the rivers to our reservoirs. With this water, we can irrigate our vineyards, controlling the amount that the vines receive. Mendoza, we have dry climate and a dry wind of the Andes that reduce need to use fungicides and pesticides. Because it's a desert, there is a big temperature difference between day and night that produce high quality grapes with good acidity. Malvik is the most famous grape from Argentina. This grape was brought to Argentina from southern western France over a century ago. Here in Argentina, it found the ideal growing conditions, allowing us to make wines that are intense, full of flavor, and very soft. Our best uh, grapes come from Nazarena's vineyard. It's a vineyard planted in 1923. These old wines give us wines that are concentrate and full of flavors that you can feel in these wines. In order to obtain the best quality wines, the grapes are harvested by hand. This allows us to pick up only perfectly ripe grapes to make wines with optimal balance and structure, soft tannins and long finish. At the winery, the grapes are carefully inspected. The fruit has to be perfect, so we have two sorting tables to take out bad bunches and leaves. Then the grapes go to a stainless steel tank and ferment temperature control. When the wine has finished fermenting, we do a final malolactic fermentation to convert the malic acid to lactic acid. This is essential step in creating soft, uh, soft wines. This is done in oak barrels, and to finish, the wine is aged in these barrels. Las Nazarenas Malbec 2018 is a beautiful Malbec from Agrelo, Mendoza. It's a very fruity and easy drinking wine with aromas of cherries and violets, and in the mouth is soft and has a really nice acidity. I hope you enjoy it. Well, thank you very much, Miss Vicky. Um, I would like to pull up the wine slide to give you a little bit more information regarding this wine as you continue to enjoy and get prepared for our next wine. We've had some comments from various clients saying, man, it really is interesting to see how, how uh, nice looking some of your uh, winemakers are, which uh, from around the world, so it's not necessarily a requirement to become a winemaker, but certainly we have some uh, very uh, nice looking uh, winemakers, both in Argentina, South America, as well as overseas. So 
as you guys can see from the slide in front of you, a little bit more information about this particular wine. Beyond that, you know, just as you may or may not know, the Malbec grape itself or wines made with the Malbec grape have really become very, very popular in the last six, seven, eight, ten years here in the United States. Not saying that these wines were not available prior to that, but as the quality production of the wine has gone up, the quality of the finished product has gone up, the demand here in the United States has gone up, you know, proportionately to that. With that being said, you're simply looking at our number one selling, one of our number one selling dry reds in our, in our entire program through the last few years because of the increasing popularity of Malbec. With that also being said, Malbec is a grape varietal that is very important in France in a particular region. As Vicky had mentioned, this grape came to Argentina and found its home there from the southwest part of France. She's speaking specifically of Bordeaux. In Bordeaux, there are five grape varietals that are used to make their red versions of wine. One of those happens to be Malbec, of course. Then we have Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, which are the two predominant grapes utilized in making both left bank and right bank red Bordeaux wines. Also, sometimes Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot, along with Malbec, can be blended in for various aromas, colors, changes to the palate, just rounding out that wine. With that being said, let's go ahead and take a moment to finish out this wine. I uh, recently enjoyed a bottle of this Malbec a couple weeks ago, and with Kevin's notes, Kevin Burnett is our uh, national wine educator. He's one of our district managers based in Kansas City, Missouri. He is a level three uh, WSET certified sommelier. He helped to create these so slides, so thank you for that, Kevin. Um, the WSET stands for the Wine Spirit and Education Trust, which is one of the two largest uh, recognized bodies for certifying sommeliers of all levels from around the world. So I hope you enjoy this extra information on the slides. I did happen to have this, as he said, food pairing wise a couple weeks ago with a nice cut of beef with some chimichurri. And I can promise you that food pairing works out spectacularly well. So with that being said, please get prepared. Uh, let's pour out a little bit of the Roger 1930 Limited lot from the Echeverria family, the Casa Nueva Vineyard in Chile. I would like to introduce you guys to Roberto Echeverria Jr., one of the family members that own this vineyard dating back nearly a century, along with his head winemaker, Victor, they're going to give you a great explanation about our next wine and one that I'm actually enjoying in the glass right now. So let's look forward to the Roger 1930 Limited Lot. Enjoy, folks. Here we are today, um, and now we're going to taste one of our wines, and we're going to unwrap it, and the wine is Roger, 1930 Limited Lot. Uh, this wine, we're going to taste it today with our winemaker, Victor. So Hi. here we can see Victor here beside me, and give you the bottle, Victor. Tell me something. Mm, nice bottle. Uh, the name, Roberto Roger, 1930, why? Okay, well, the name comes because of my great-grandfather. He came from Montpellier in France, and he selected some uncrafted uh, grapes uh, that he kind of chose, mm -hmm. and he brought them here uh, to Chile, uh -huh. and he planted at that, at that time. So Roger was the name of my grand grandfather. 
Roger Pifre de Bovan. So, third generation. Uh, I'm the fourth generation. Ah, fourth generation. Yeah. Ah. So he was the first generation here in Chile. Ah. Yeah. And Victor, tell me something about the wine. What do you think about the... Uh, why do we call it limited lot? Okay, so here we call it limited lot because we only produce uh, less than 5,000 bottles. So finally, 20 to 22 barrels. Okay, so this, for example, this one says, yeah, bottle number 2429. Huh? Okay, so <laughs> yeah, so today we're going to taste bottle 2429 of the limited lot of Roger 1930. Maybe Victor, I open the wine and you okay. can tell me a little bit about the, okay. the blend and the region. Okay, so here uh, we have uh, wine from Curico. Uh, it's a blend of 85% of Cabernet Sauvignon, 5% of Petit Verdot, uh, 5% of Carignan, and 5% of Carmenier. Why 85% uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon for the air structure, then the Petit Verdot for the raw and the soft tannins, the Carignan for color and acidity, mm. and then finally the Carmenier. Why? Because mm. we are in Chile. So in Chile. That's it. Why not Carmenet if we're in Chile? So our camera girl, we're gonna see if she can see the bottle. Yes, she can see the bottle. Yes, so Roger 1930. Tell me, Victor, color. What do you think about the color? Here we have a very nice color, very deep, very purple. Yeah, very intense, huh? Very intense on the noise. And, and deep color, huh? Very you, deep. You cannot see through to the, to the light. Nose, intense also. Very, very intense. Yeah. Here we can feel on the nose the total uh, 18 months in barrel. Mm -hmm. 18 months. French? French oak or 100% French barrel. 100%. Mm. Well, one little detail we forgot to bring our spittoon, so we had to drink. Uh, the wine. So yeah, in the mouth, it's very silky, very easy drinking, very soft. You can feel the complexity of the spice, like tobacco, some chocolate, chocolate. Uh, but it's very silky, very soft. What do you think? It's very interesting this wine because the blending of the four different grapes blending very well. Like when you are cooking mm. and you mix it, for example, salt and pepper, mm -hmm. uh, cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Mm. are very blended, very complex. Yeah, so the four varieties, I think what you were saying, Carina Sauvignon adds the structure, mm. Petit Verdot, a lot of color and, and flavor, Carmenere the spice. Carmenere the spicy and a little bit of pepper. Yeah, exactly, and Carignan also gives some of Carignan the... Carignan gives you acidity yeah. and a very deep and intense color. Yeah, so obviously because of the nice acidity, this is a great wine also to be enjoyed with, with food. So, uh, thanks and a tribute to my great-grandfather, Roger, 1930. Uh, um, 1930 is the year that he arrived to Chile. So, uh, cheers. Hope you enjoy uh, this wine um, from the central and the origin of winemaker's paradise here in Chile. Salud. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Roberto and Victor. For our dry red drinkers, uh, especially those of you that have had experience with many of our Casa Nueva wines for many years, who really enjoyed that as not only a wine you can enjoy today, but also one that certainly would lay down well for years and possibly even a decade or so ahead. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I agree, I, this is one of my favorite wines being a dry red wine drinker primarily. And with this being a very limited wine, certainly something to enjoy and have in the wine rack. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up uh, the information slide made uh, by Kevin and show you guys and tell you a little bit more about this fantastic wine. All right, so here we go. So once again, the Roger 1930 Limited Lot. So just so you guys know how this wine was made, they described uh, the picking of the grapes or the harvesting of the grapes. These grapes were produced, or this wine was produced in a way that's known as a technique called assemblage. 
the four grape varietals, the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Petit Verdot, the Carignan, and the Carmenere were harvested individually. They were crushed, they were fermented, and then they were put into individual oak barrels, each grape by itself, for 12 months. This particular uh, vineyard is using 225 liter French oak barrels for 12 months to allow the wine to age appropriately for their tastes. After that, what happens is they go ahead and start taking various percentages, blending them together in the lab, so to speak, tasting those uh, four different wines, seeing what percentages they wanna take and finalize to make the finished wine. So in this case, obviously, they took 85% Cabernet and 5% of each of the three other varietals. They took those four grapes now in those proportions, blended them, put them back into barrel for French barrels for another six months, and then to bottle. So that is a process that's known as assemblage. So you're essentially assembling a wine one part at a time. Another interesting fact about this is they got really excited there when they mentioned Carmenere. Carmenere is a grape varietal that is very famous in Chile. Not that it's not produced in other parts of the world, it certainly is, but Carmenere is really known as, the home, as a home to Chile from a grape varietal. It was originally planted, this grape varietal was planted in the Medoc area of Bordeaux in France and at one time was utilized as a sixth grape out of the current five that are still used to this day in making red Bordeaux wines. What had happened is this is the, became known as the lost Bordeaux varietal. When his grandfather, or great-grandfather, excuse me, brought this grape over to Chile and planted it, for about 150 years, this grape became lost because it was inadvertently preserved as to be thought as Merlot. Merlot's a popular grape that's been produced in Chile and other parts of the world for many centuries. But through the last 150 years, the Chilean people thought, the winemakers in particular, the vineyard managers in particular, thought that they were picking Merlot. But as genetic testing with grapes have come along over the last decade or two, Back in 1998, they realized that not all the Merlot they were picking was Merlot, that actually Carmenere still, still existed. So a lot of the winemakers were very excited in the wineries down there in Chile. So they really took this grape to become their own and not only use it as a standalone varietal to make great red wines, but in, in this particular case, making a fantastic blended red that's enjoyable now and for years and decades ahead to lay down. One last point with this to, no, to, to note is that it's called the limited lot for a region, reason. They produce less than 5,000 bottles, actually about 4,900 bottles, give or take. You know, we did send out a lot of samples because we had a great, uh, you know, great feedback and interest in this uh, tasting. So a lot of these 4,900 bottles did go out to each and every one of you around the country to taste today. So we do have a very limited amount of this wine. So certainly for those of you that enjoy wines that can be approached now of this style, like to see how great wines, uh, red wines be, how they will develop over time in the bottle and in your wine cellar, coolers, or wine racks in the weeks, months, decades ahead. This is a perfect wine based on its limited availability to certainly make a selection with your wine consultant. So from that standpoint, this is our last dry red wine. We do have one final wine to present here in the program today. So I would like to give you a moment to go ahead and get the Humia into your glass. I'm sure our uh, red, sweet red wine drinkers are essentially foaming at the mouth for this wine, not only because it's a very popular sweet red wine, but also the only sweet red wine presented here today. So let me go ahead and pull up the videos that we have uh, regarding our Humia. The first video that'll come up, folks, is in full Spanish, but it does have English subtitles describing in great detail and showing you 
some fantastic scenery from the region of Jumea in the south of, uh, of Spain, but also the second video is bringing Lars back from earlier on to tell you a little bit more of the intricacies and specificity about this particular vintage of wine. So let me pull that video up. I hope you guys enjoy our final wine of the program. sureste de España, entre las provincias de Murcia y Albacete, se encuentra en la denominación de origen protegida Jumilla, una tierra de altiplano y transición entre el litoral levantino mediterráneo y la meseta castellano manchega. 30.000 hectáreas de viñedo sobre una tierra dura, pedregosa, perfecta para el excelente cultivo de la vid. La histórica ciudad murciana de Jumilla, con su imponente castillo, es su centro neurálgico y sede del Consejo Regulador. Seis localidades albaceteñas completan la denominación de origen. Zona vinícola desde la época de los fenicios y una de las primeras denominaciones de origen constituidas en España, concretamente en 1966, conjuga la tradición y la modernidad. sus valles y llanos se extienden los viñedos al pie de las bodegas, donde se cuida con mimo todo el proceso de elaboración. La extraordinaria personalidad de sus vinos está marcada por una variedad autóctona, la monastrel, que representa el 80% del viñedo plantado muy mediterránea que da a los vinos unos colores picotas brillantes, unos aromas frutales elegantes y complejos y una boca marcada, plena, tan sabrosa como equilibrada. Una uva y un vino que han sabido marcar su personalidad y que ha convertido a la denominación de origen Jumilla en una de las más sólidas y punteras de todo el país con un enorme reconocimiento tanto a nivel nacional como internacional. serios, frescos y elegantes que representan la pura esencia mediterránea. Vinos de Jumilla, esencia mediterránea.
Well, thank you very much, Lars. Uh, we appreciate your time. I hope you guys enjoyed the video there. I'm gonna go also back to our slide on this wine and tell you a little bit more about the Humia. And then we'll go ahead and conclude the tasting, give you, giving you an opportunity to speak with your wine consultants in the coming day or so regarding any interest. So Humia, you know, this is a grape, uh, this is a wine that's made with the grape type called Monastrel, as he said. This is also known as Mouverdre in other parts of the world, both out of California oftentimes, uh, in blending with Syrahs many times, and Grenache. Uh, it's a very important grape also in a region in the southern part of France known as the Rhone region, um, helping to make some fantastic wines there. But in Spain, this is the fifth most widely planted grape varietal. So it is a very important grape varietal. In this style, you see it to be a little bit to the sweeter side. It is produced in drier formats as well, but this is a great expression of a sweeter style of wine that's not cloying on the palate, that though it has some sweetness, that sweetness is natural as opposed to man-made. It allows for a wonderful bouquet and aroma with a subtle and soft finish to it. Uh, and then a very enjoyable wine overall. This grape type is also something that I can note that, you know, our wine consultants were very sad uh, to hear that this wine was released in, I wanna say just around Easter time, back in like mid-April, give or take. Um, and it was put into this program for you folks today, our clients, um, but about a week, 10 days ago, we did have to put, uh, a stop on this, meaning our wine consultants were no longer allowed to continue selling this wine in preparation for this event, because with it being a very popular sweet red wine in our program, we started seeing the inventory we have available to us for this event um, dwindling. So 10 days ago, we said, hey guys and gals, let's go ahead and wait. Let's make sure we have enough of this wine for the clients that taste and enjoy it during the virtual showcase. So not trying to be a salesman here, but certainly a consultant to you, both on a national level, as I will with my personal consult or clients. If you really enjoyed this wine at the end of the tasting, when you have a chance to have a conversation, a text, an email, or all of these above, all of those above with your wine consultant, I would certainly make a suggestion, a suggestion of adding this to your stock of wines at home because I don't expect this to be around much after our conclusion of this weekend's tastings here. So with that, I would also like to bring myself back up on camera to close out the tasting. For our sweet drinkers though, before I do so, can I get a show of hands? What did we think? Uh, raise your hand if you really enjoyed that wine. Well, that's going up quite a bit. That's a, that's a lot of hands being raised. You know, our, our sweet red wine program is certainly one of the stronger components of our program because out in the typical wine world, it's very difficult to find good quality sweet red wines. And certainly, in my opinion, PRP has one of the greatest selections of sweet red wines throughout the course of the year. And I hope this is a great representation of a wine from that part of our program. So with that, let me go ahead and bring myself back up on camera and we'll go ahead and finish this out. All right, folks, so welcome back. My my, uh, I'm a little parched, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab a quick little drink here. So, uh, you know, I recently visited with uh, my physician, making sure everything was okay. And, uh, you know, he told me, as many of you have probably been told, a glass or two of wine a day is certainly uh, good and healthy. So I'm going to go ahead and sip from my typical glass that I utilize in the office and at home here. So give me a moment. Oh, that's some good Roger 1930 limited lot in there. So my, my, I can tell you this much. My physician never says how big the glass can be. He just says, 
one to two glasses at a time in a given evening. So choose your glass size appropriately to ensure your enjoyment on any given wine drinking evening. So with that, once again, I would like to finish up with a few different things. One, first and foremost, is a thank you to each and every one of you. I see uh, currently about 199 participants still with us. Um, it is totally our pleasure here at PRP Wine to be able to provide this opportunity to share our wines, share our winemaker's passion, and all the science and artistry that goes into making any wine, whether it be ours or otherwise. You know, the passion that these folks have in making wines, I can certainly tell you from 19 years in the wine world, traveling the great regions throughout the world, sampling a lot of different great wines and many not so great wines that at the end of the day, good winemakers, their heart and their soul goes into every bottle. And I truly believe our winemakers at PRP that we deal with uh, epitomize that fact. So with that being said, I would like to bring you back to that back portion of the menu and give you a quick explanation here. So the menu you might have been taking notes on. The back menu here that's in front of you is actually the entirety of our current uh, price list of wines that are available. Um, we do want to make sure you're aware that, sure, it's great that you found some fantastic wines possibly out of the six, whether it's one, two, three, all of them, to fit your needs as a wine consumer and a client of ours, but certainly make sure that you take a look at the back of the wine menu because there's a lot of great wines we were unable to send out to you today that are still available for selection um, with your wine consultant as they discuss with you post tasting. Couple notes to make. On a few of the wines as you go down the list, you'll see a single asterisk. The single asterisk is a representation of a wine that essentially we reduce the price of around 30 or 33%. They're great wines that have a great price point on them. So if they're wines you've had in the past or wines you might want to give a try, the single asterisk wines have very reduced prices along with them to begin with. You'll also notice some wines that have two asterisks next to them. The two asterisk, wine, two asterisk wines are wines that are currently still part of the tariff war, so to speak, going on between both the U.S. and China, but in this case, the U.S. and the European Union. Back in mid to late October, tariffs were imposed on wines coming into the United States, primarily from France, Germany, and Spain. So a few of our wines, unfortunately, are still under that tariff and a $2 per bottle tariff surcharge, which is simply a tax, tax passed on to the government, um, will be imposed on those wines. Most importantly on the back of the menu is what can we give to you as complimentary and additional free wines for your placing in order with your consultant post tasting? At the bottom, bottom of the menu, you will see some great free complimentary additional wines added to any order that you place with your wine consultant. I do want to point out that this special offer, which has been going on since mid to late March when the first stay at home orders were put in place, this does end on Memorial Day Monday. So please, if you're interested in the wines that you found today and you want to make sure you're able to acquire those alongside your, with the help of your wine consultant, I certainly recommend reaching out. They'll be reaching out to you via text, email, phone to discuss your needs to fill those holes in the wine rack. Once again, I've done a lot of algebra for the first time in 25 years and it's certainly put a dent in my wine coolers in my house. With that being said, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your attendance. Though I know I'm not perfect and we're not perfect with this first run through on this as a virtual national tasting from the East Coast to the West Coast, I hope you've learned a little bit, had a little bit of a good time, taking your mind off of any situations in your personal life, of course, but most importantly, I know some of you have some family and friends around tasting wines with you. And wine is truly a social product that is best served with those that you love and care about. So with that being said, I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you for attending. 
I'm going to enjoy a little bit more of this nicely decanted Roger 1930. Please enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Please enjoy Memorial Day for what it stands for. But most importantly, thank you to you, the ownership for allowing us to put this together, our wine consultants, of course, for getting you interested in following up with you post-tasting to collect any order interests you may have. And I wish you all a safe and healthy day, week, months ahead as we all go through this, this together. Cheers to each and every one of you. Love from Tampa. Peace out, folks.